Universidad de Nueva de Lisboa and the National Quincentennial Committee of the Republic of the Philippines. It is now 4 p.m. local time. Good afternoon from Manila. We are live streaming on the conference YouTube channel and the National Quincentennial Committee Facebook page. Good afternoon to all in the Zoom room and on social media. The Department of Fine Arts is happy to host today's panel. Our department is happy to participate in this month-long conference series. The conference has four parts and we are currently in part four, Legacies of the Encounter in Forms of Expression, and this is the 15th panel. I am Bianca Maalat, and I will be your moderator for today's panel on flows of art, artifacts, and art styles. For the next two hours, we will have presentations from four speakers, followed by an open forum for about 30 to 40 minutes. We will entertain questions from three audiences here in the Zoom room, from the YouTube comment section, and from Facebook. Our community managers will monitor those channels and relay questions to us. I invite our viewers to please type your questions and we will gather them and read them out loud for you later. Let me now introduce our first speaker. We have Dr. Alexandra Corvello joining us from Lisbon today. With a PhD in History of Art, Alexandra Corvello is Associate Professor at NOVA FCSH, Board Member of the Art History Institute, and Associate Researcher of the Center for Humanities, or CHAM. She is the author and or editor of several books, including Nanban Folding Screen Masterpieces, Japan, Portugal, 17th Century, Book Chapters, and Scientific Articles. She has participated in and co-organized several international conferences and workshops. She was the editor-in-chief of the Bulletin of Portuguese-Japanese Studies from 2010 to 2016, and is currently a member of the Board of Direction of the Art History Journal published by IHA. She was the principal investigator of the research project, Interactions Between Rivals, the Christian Mission and Buddhist Sects in Japan, financed by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, or FCT. She was co-curator of the exhibitions, A Striking Story, Portugal, Japan, 16th to 20th Centuries, Portugal, Jesuits, and Japan, Spiritual Beliefs and Earthly Goods, and scientific curator of the exhibition, Nanban Commissions, the Portuguese in Modern Age Japan. In January 2018, she was appointed advisor of Nanban culture by the mayor of Amakusa Island, Japan. She is now here this afternoon to present her study entitled The Circulation of Paintings Between China and Japan and the Vice Royalties of Peru and New Spain in the 17th century. Let us welcome Dr. Carvello. Hello and uh, good afternoon to everybody in Asia and good morning to the ones in Europe. And thank you very much for this invitation and uh, congratulations for the wonderful organization of this conference. So I will start by sharing my um, PowerPoint, which I hope it will work. Okay, I'm sorry, this is the best I can do now. I, I hope you can see it. So uh, my presentation is about the circulation of paintings between China and Japan and the vice royalties of Peru and New Spain during the 17th centuries. And I have structured the presentation uh, according to two main lines. Uh, first, to uh, briefly uh, talk about this reoriented world map uh, in the 17th century. And then I will talk about the circulation of religious paintings uh, between different Christian missions in the Pacific zone. I will start by uh, analyzing some paintings on wood and copper, and then talk about uh, uh, some uh, folding screens before um, the final remarks. So the first image I'm showing is from a so-called Nanban folding screen, meaning 
uh, the art that emerges in Japan during the presence of the Southern Europeans from the middle of the 16th century until more or less the middle of the 17th century. And this is a folding screen that uh, can be probably associated with uh, the painting seminary that was opened in Japan by the Jesuits. Uh, it is um, a, a very peculiar uh, uh, projection of the world because it's centered in the Pacific zone. Um, so uh, uh, Japan and the Philippines really emerge as the center of this world. And therefore I use the term, we orient the world uh, map. Uh, this is a folding screen that uh, uh, um, whose map uh, maps projection uh, is taken from the uh, very famous Matteo Ricci map of 1602 um, that is quite known uh, and that is uh, uh, oriented uh, and or positioned from a, a, an Asian and a Pacific uh, viewpoint. Um, so I will talk mainly um, about uh, what was happening in China and uh, in Japan in the Christian missions in uh, these two places um, that uh, as other places of the so-called Portuguese Padroado or patronage in the East, uh, the Christian mission lived in almost a permanent shortage of material. There was an absolute need for books, for instance, for some instruments and mainly for uh, optical instruments and images as well. Uh, if in the case of Japan, the Jesuits letters continuously insist on the need to send all kinds of material to the mission, in China, this problem sometimes becomes the central subject of a great number of letters that were written to, you, to Rome and to Europe. For instance, the sending of a good mathematician, of a good painter, and of someone expert in the art of uh, watchmaking is suggested in a very interesting letter that was sent um, to the general uh, of the Jesuits in Rome in a letter that was written in Macau by the end of the 16th century. This document written by Manuel Diaz is a sort of reminder for an embassy that the Jesuits from Macau intended to send to China. The retinue, besides including experts in the art of cal calculation, painting and mechanics, and sometimes all these uh, fields were really interconnected, should also include a whole uh, set of objects and devices. Together with the reference to a good quality oil, oil paintings and being oil paintings uh, in terms of technique was quite uh, uh, important, um, in the case of this letter written by the Portuguese Jesuit Manuel Dias, um, there is specific indications to the subjects that these paintings should depict. Uh, for instance, the Virgin of St. Lucas, the Assumption, the Adoration of the Mardi, and the so-called uh, Majestic uh, Saints. So another important iconography is also the Salvator Mundi, or Christ, Christ as savior of the world, with its message of peace and redemption, a subject that appears in some Namban folding screens, like the one I'm showing, that were made in Japan, alluding to the Christian mission in the territory, such as in the case of this pair of screens in the collection of Namban Bunkanka in Osaka, or um, the ones belonging to the collections of the Sanomaro Shotokan in Tokyo. Um, it was precisely in Japan that Jesuits opened in the 1590s a painting seminary to which I already made some reference, where it was taught Western style, meaning European painting and engraving. It was this painting school that provided both Japan and China with Christian images. 
um, as attested by several document documental references, as the excerpt, excerpt here shown, refer, referring to a painting of a Salvatore Mundi made by Giovanni Niccolo, the Italian Jesuit in charge of the painting school, sent from Japan to China. Moreover, this painting school instructed a group of skilled and talented Japanese and Chino Japanese artists that for the most part left to Macau in 1614 after the ban of Christianity in Japan. Macau thus became a center for the production of Christian images and some of these paintings disseminated their apprenticeship in other parts of China, including in Beijing. One of the most celebrated of these painters was Jacob Niva, also known as Jacob Niva. And here I show uh, Salvatore Mundi probably made by uh, uh, Niva um, that is now in the collection of the Tokyo University Library. Jacob Niva, also known as Giacomo, Giacomo Nijeng from his Chinese name, was born in Japan in 1579 from a Chinese father and a Japanese mother, was trained by Niccolo in the Jesuit painting seminary in Japan. And in the beginning of the 17th century, we find him working in Macau already and soon after in Beijing because Matteo Ricci asked him to go to Beijing. And there he met Ricci, probably he worked with Ricci in the world map that I have just shown, uh, for sure in the world map of 1603, but probably in the version, the, the original version in, of 1602. We know that he died in, the, in 1638, after, or, or, or more than 10 years after Giovanni Niccolo. So Matteo Ricci, with whom Niva worked uh, in Beijing refers to a painting that uh, Niva executed after a so-called Spanish original that had arrived in China through the Philippines in 1586. This painting depicted the Virgin and Child with John the Baptist and according to Matteo Ricci it caused quite a sensation in China. And here I have an excerpt referring precisely to this uh, event. Um, in a hanging oratory with a painting depicting the Holy Family, probably made uh, in, in, in New Spain, the painting, the, the piece, the furniture piece was made in Japan, uh, we can observe a similar iconography that from uh, Europe, spread across Asia and the Americas as well, as testified from numerous paintings affiliated with the so-called Barocco Cusqueño in the 17th century. Another important iconography relates to the image of Saint Joseph that already appears here in the Holy Family, but images of Saint Joseph alone with Christ as a child. And for that, we should bear in mind uh, that as from the Counter-Reformation uh, onwards, the figure of St. Joseph, the worldly father of Jesus, became an example of virtue because of his unselfish work and continuous um, self-denial, uh, uh, so to say. Among the re remaining specimens, let us consider an image that is now in Lisbon, in Museu do Oriente. Uh, the painting again is included in a Japan oratory, but the painting in itself was made, uh, is, is, uh, is made of wood with uh, um, uh, uh, the use of uh, different techniques. Let us now consider the uh, uh, oratory, the hanging or oratory, with the application of lacquer and mother of pearl inlaid uh, and with different uh, decorated uh, techniques, Japanese techniques like maquillage, 
and uh, also a Japanese iconography uh, of birds and trees, namely Japanese camellia, uh, framed with these inlaid bands. Uh, inside, as we can see, there is zoomorphic and vegetal themes repeated and represented um, all over with uh, the so-called Tashibana, the tangerine trees, and Sakura, the cherry trees. So with this um, uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, elements. Although this piece, the oratory itself, is interesting due to its artistic and cultural uh, syncretism, because the format of this piece is uh, uh, associated uh, and related to the European specimens that arrived in Asia. Uh, it is, however, the central image, image, the old oil painting on wood with the depiction of Saint Joseph with the, with the child in his arms that draws our attention. The question that I already referred to about the source of painting set in Namban oratories arises in this case with, I believe, a special relevance as shown by this selected iconography. And I say this because indeed we are before a quite uncommon image in the Portuguese pictorial tradition, but an image that is recurrent in Spanish painting and therefore in the vice royalties of New Spain, where in fact, St. Joseph was the patron saint and Peru. The image of St. Joseph as, as a youth and not as a man of old age is found associated with his Hispanic mystic visions, such as those of St. Teresa de Jesus. And it is unquestionable that we are dealing here with the transposition of engraved models um, made in Europe to another kind of support, even more so when we observe other similar examples, especially in Peru and associated with the so-called Escuela Cusqueña from Cusco. Among the list of objects that the Christian mission in Japan and China frequently requested from Europe, there is another interesting category of paintings. And in China, for instance, they were uh, destined to the emperor and empresses. Uh, in the uh, missionary letters, they are referred to as the king and the queen, uh, as it is suggested in some missionary documents, such as this letter, to which I already made reference, written from uh, by Manuel Dias to Claudio Aquaviva in Rome, where um, in which uh, Manuel Dias states that if some of the images would come, shall they be made as the ones coming from New Spain, made of colored plumage, as they would be very appreciated. We find echoes of the demand for feather works, the so-called plumaria, made in New Spain in several letters sent by different Jesuits uh, located in Asia. Such demands came either from Japan and China, and they attest to the interest for such works coming from Mexico, and that we may well presume were circulating throughout the Portuguese missions in Asia. And, uh, and not only, I believe, associated uh, with the Jesuits, although they played here an important role. As it seems to be, such pieces were appreciated for their beauty and mastery skill in accordance though with the news we have about the work achieved by Mexican artists dedicated to this art rooted in the pre-Hispanic world. One important set of documents witnessing to the circulation of plumaria um, with Christian teams in the context of, China, of the China mission is the 1617 inventories of the Jesuit residence in Nanjing made in the boisterous context of the anti-Christian persecution. The first of these inventories consists in two lists that mention a whole set of 224 items, 
equivalent to about 1,400 pieces. And there is reference to four Plumaria uh, paintings, uh, paintings that depicted the four seasons, which is a curious subject and rooted both in Chinese and Japanese um, iconography and uh, subject. That the circulation of models, paintings and engravings and even artists, as we have seen, occurred between the territories of New Spain, Peru, Japan and China, mostly through the Philippines is, is unquestionable when studying these paintings. However, there is a last group of pictorial compositions to which I would like to call your attention now. I have chosen three, three exemplars, one in a Mexican collection, another in a Portuguese museum, and the latter in a European private collection. As in the case of the already mentioned paintings, these folding screens also attest to the circulation of artists, of objects, of models, and of materials from different cultural zones. However, in the case of these folding screens, they further reflect processes of cultural transfer, that is, processes of relocation of, of migration from one cultural situation to another cultural situation, where any image and objects fall into a new context and takes or could take a new meaning. The first screen that I'm showing um, belongs to the Museo Sumaya, Fundación Carlos Slim in Mexico City. I, I have here a photo I have taken some years ago when I studied the, the, the folding screen in Mexico and uh, uh, another picture um, of the a planification of the same screen. It is most probably one of a pair and it depicts the deluge. The other missing screen, as Ivan Leroy Ayala already proposed, could represent one of the other sets of punishments or punishments referred to in the Old Testament, the burning of Sodom or the destruction of the Tower of Babel. Although the iconography is revealing and in my view, does necessarily establish a religious commission, but defin definitely relates to a Chinese, Japanese imaginary. For the purpose of this presentation, I want to stress the technical and material features as they testify to the cultural ex exchanges between different cultural zones in a folding screen produced in the 17th century, probably in Macau, and using Japanese techniques of construction. These techniques are presented in the making of the screen itself with its light structure made of a wooden frame filled with paper, which allows it to easily fold and be relocated. On the other hand, the Chinese screens are largely made of massive wood being difficult to move and transport. Another important technical and material feature of this screen in Mexico is the application of shell paste and glue embossed with gold leaf, which you can see in Japanese screens as well. And here I show a detail of a number screen made in Japan, of course, with the same kind of technique application. Another uh, feature is the application of Karakami printed cotton fabric on the reverse of these screens. I'm here showing a, a 17th century Japanese screen in the Metropolitan Museum collection that depicts screens or folding screens inside the screen. I call your attention to the depiction of the uh, back side of each screen with this Karakami uh, fabric on the reverse and here I'm showing a picture I have taken from the screen, the reverse part of the screen in the Sumaya Museum with this application exactly of the Karakami printed cotton fabric on the reverse. The second folding screen, again, one of a pair is in Lisbon 
uh, at the National Art Museum and depicts the Portuguese Restoration Wars and the portrait of the Portuguese kings. It ends with the future John V as a prince, which allow us to propose the date of production between 1703 and 1708. The international team of conservators and restorators that studied the screen, in which I took part, came to the conclusion that most probably this screen was made in Macau for reasons relatable to the ones already mentioned to the Mexican, the Sumaya collection screen, and which led us to refer to it as a Sino or Chinese Japanese folding screen. This is the reverse of the screen in the Lisbon collection uh, with Chinese paper on it, very different as we can see from the Sumaya collection screen. And here, the detail attesting to the same application of shell paste and glue embossed with gold leaf in the upper part of the Lisbon collection screen. Finally, the last uh, folding screen uh, that I am showing is currently in a private collection and only very recently came to my attention, thanks to the owner to whom I really thank. It is again one of a possible pair and depicts the Battle of Alexander the Great against Darius, the Battle of Ixus, as one can read in a Portuguese written inscription Corre Fortuna entre Alexandre e Dario, along with the inclusion of scenes related to the Old Testament in the upper part of the composition. The catalogue in which it appeared at the moment of its selling refers to it as have, having been made probably in Goa in the 17th century. In my view, and due to the ev evident resemblances with the Lisbon screen that I have just shown, Macau is the most probable location for the production of this screen. And we also should admit the possibility of extending the chronology to the beginning of the 18th century, exactly like the uh, National Art Museum in Lisbon screen. In both cases, they are contemporary of the production of folding screens for a Western clientele, not only in Macau, but in other parts of Asia and across the Pacific in New Spain as well. A place, New Spain, where the production of folding screens that are called biombus, the same as the Portuguese word for folding screen came from the Japanese biobu, was truly outstanding and testifies to the connections with Japan and mostly with China through the Philippines. In my research and based on documental and material evidence, I have been assuming Macau as a core place for the understanding of cultural and artistic dynamics in the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century that have for long been forgotten. However, in the footsteps of Thomas Acosta Kaufman and his notion of active transformation stemming from processes of active reception, rather than describing Macau as a distinctive area set apart from other areas, I believe that Macau should be understood as an essential part of a cultural field. This cultural field um, of which I believe Macau was an important core also included other important centers located in China, in Japan, in the Philippines, above all Manila, and the Spanish viceroyalties of the Americas, particularly New Spain and Peru. It is within the intersection of these different cultural fields that we can better understand works and images such as the ones presented here, as they are the product of a wild circulation of people, of objects, of models, 
able to overcome any political boundaries and to create or establish new identities and even to convey a different world perspective. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Carvello, for that presentation. Let me now introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Sylvie Morishta. She is a French citizen born in 1955. Dr. Sylvie Morishta has lived in the United States and Japan. She received a doctorate in Catholic theology from the University of Strasbourg in 2016. She has published The Art of Catholic Missions in Japan from the 16th to the 17th century in 2020. She writes and lectures on the history of Catholic missions in Japan. She is here with us this afternoon to present her work entitled Iberian Trade Routes and the Circulation of Works of Art between Europe and Japan, 16th to 17th century. Let us welcome Dr. Sylvie. Hello from France. I would like first of all to thank the Lisbon and Manila organizers for this uh, conference, for their invitation, which gives me the opportunity to share a few insights into my research about the art of Catholic missions in 16th century. I have divided my presentation in three points. First of all, the works of art that the Jesuits introduced into Japan, then the pictorial subjects introduced by the mendicant orders, and finally, the paintings linked to the Keicho mission. All along, we will try to find out which route was taken or might have been taken. So first of all, the works of art linked to the activities of the Jesuits. Uh, museum, libraries, and archives in Japan, as well as in Western countries, keep works of art that are related to the school of art that the Jesuits founded in Nagasaki in 1590. Since the Portuguese Paduado was the frame of the activities of the Jesuits in Japan, we may assume that most of the works of art that they imported from Europe reached Japan through the, uh, uh, Span the Portuguese route. Oh. I should share my screen. Okay, so this is the first, although it's very well known, I would like to uh, show this very long route between uh, Lisbon and uh, Nagasaki, uh, just to remind us that it would take two years and a half for um, a missionary who would leave Lisbon to get to, uh, na to Nagasaki. The painting imported from Europe were used as models for the school of art uh, that the Japanese founded in uh, Nagasaki. The Tokyo National Museum keeps just one example of uh, an original painting imported from Europe and its Japanese copy. So here on the left is the, um, the original um, European painting and on the right, the copy made by Japanese artists of the Jesuit school of art. Um, these paintings, these paintings and others uh, were kept in um, a very, very special storage room in the palace of the governor of Nagasaki because uh, they confiscated paintings and kept them in th this very special storage room and, and until the 1870s when it was transferred to, um, to Tokyo. Uh, the Flemish engravings in particular were uh, an, an important source um, of inspiration for the short-lived Jesuit school of art in Japan. So I have here um, an example of uh, those first engravings because the first book 
This is the first book printed in Japan by the Jesuit Mission Press in 1591. The, the Jesuits introduced new techniques like oil painting on canvas, but they also introduced uh, the printing press and the technique of copper plate engravings, which were unknown in Japan at the time. This is an example of the first book published in Japan. It is a book about the life of science and the, the two uh, parts, each part has an engraving, the same except that on the right, uh, the second part, uh, the border was deleted, probably because it was a tricky job. And the, the, this um, illustration, this print comes from, a, uh, is an adaptation of a, a print uh, published in a liturgi liturgical book by Christophe Plantin uh, in Antwerp. The, the, the original book reached Japan and the Jesuits used it as um, a source for this, um, this screen. Just three, this uh, book, just three copies of this book, of this rare book exist in the world. This was taken, I took this picture from the copy kept in the French library, French National Library. All three books are kept in Europe. And there was also Italian engravings. And again, this is, one example um, of an original Italian engraving on the left, and it's Japanese copy made in the School of Art. The, the Jesuits praised uh, their Japanese students for their skills in copying the, um, the, the, the European engravings. Um, this is kept in the private archives of the Tokugawa family since it was confiscated to Christians in the 1620s. Uh, it, it was the original Italian engraving on the left was published in Rome in 1573. These, these engravings are the oldest European engravings in Japan. It, it's possible, although I cannot give evidence, that this was brought to Japan by the Tensho mission, this mission that the, the Jesuits sent to Europe. The mission came back in 1590. It's possible that they, they brought back this, these engravings at this time. However, in 1591, Alessandro Valignano, the visitor of the Portuguese mission in the Far East, recommended the use of the Spanish route for quicker communications between Rome and uh, Japan. He considered that the Spanish route could be quicker than the Portuguese route where the ships were delayed by the monsoons. So this Jesuits used the Spanish route for their letters to and from Rome then it is quite possible that French engravings that were discovered in Japan a hundred years ago reached Japan through uh, the, the Philippines. Those, um, those engravings hmm? ah, here it is. Those engravings um, um, are all French from, and the authors are all engravers who were active in Paris at the turn of the 17th century. I included here the names of those people, Thomas Deleu, Léonard Gautier, Jacques Grandhomme, who were engravers, and Jean Leclerc and Nicolas de Matonier, who were uh, um, publishers, editors of engravings. Uh, all those people sold huge, amazing quantities of engravings towards Spain. And the trade of engraving is, is very well documented. The, the quantities of those engravings are quite amazing. So it's, um, it's quite possible, although it's, I cannot give full evidence, that those engravings traveled from Paris to Sevilla and then to New Spain and to, to Manila and for the last uh, route between Manila and Nagasaki. 
I cannot give full evidence, but um, research in the general archives of, in, of the Indies in Sevilla showed me that French goods were exported in rather big quantities towards, towards, not, towards Spain. So it's not impossible that those engravings might have um, reached uh, uh, Japan through the Spanish route. Here is an example of those engravings. It, it, I want to show it just how it is. It has been kept. Um, it's 12 engravings, 12 prints glued on a wooden board. One, each engraving represents the main Catholic feast days of the Catholic Church. And um, for each month, it's, I wanted to show it there because it has been discovered in this situation. So probably it, was, it has been kept like that since the 17th century. But I included um, a, a detail just to show you how it works. Um, in just one glance, you can have all the main feast days of the month. Here it is the month of March. In the foreground, you have the Annunciation, of course. And in, in the background, you have smaller scenes representing saints. Here, Pope Gregory the Great, Saint Joseph, and Thomas Aquinas. Um, those, those engravings in Japan don't have any date or signature. So the Japanese historians thought that they were Flemish. They are indeed Flemish in style, but in, I found the same series in the French department of engravings in Paris. The, the only difference is that the legends here in France are in French, here they are in Latin. And the front page had, had been kept, so it gave us the name of the author. author. It's Léonard Gautier, and the year of publication, this is 1603, which gave me a um, starting point to research in the general archives of, of the Indies in Sevilla. So I have, in fact, a question for scholars, both in Mexico and in the Philippines. Are there any uh, French engravings in your country? Um, I know it would be quite amazing since, since um, uh, because of frequent use, those were devotional prints because of frequent use in climate and insects, they are bound to get destroyed very early, but it would be very interesting to take things a little bit further and see if there are um, any uh, French engravings from the turn of the 17th century in those uh, country. Uh, I would like to stress one point is that those engravings are rare even now in France because they were um, um, early uh, destroyed. And another thing that I would like to stress is that when I researched in Paris, I found out that scholars, uh, specialists of French engravings in Paris were unaware of the presence of French engravings in Japan. That's why this, uh, this question that I've got for Mexican scholars or scholars in the Philippines. Now we'll turn to my second point, which is the, the works of art uh, connected to the activities of the mendicant orders who were active in Japan from the beginning of the 17th century. And it, obviously those subjects uh, reached Japan through the Spanish route, through the Philippines, since the Philippines were um, a stepping stone for, uh, uh, the, for Japan. Just one pictorial subject is connected with the Dominicans in Japan. This is a fumie. A fumie, uh, fumu in Japanese means to trample on, a, a means image. So it was those plates made of metal that uh, the Christians uh, in the Nagasaki area were made to trample on as a sign that they rejected Christianity. Uh, the details of this of those fumie are just worn out, completely worn out, since the plates were trampled on for 250 years. 
This is the only Dominican subject. It's the gift of the rosary from uh, uh, the Virgin Mary to Dominican saints. It's the only, it was introduced, both uh, Dominican and Jesuit uh, documents uh, show that this theme, this pictorial subject was introduced in Japan after 1614 and was widely scattered in, um, around the Nagasaki area. Now, uh, a Franciscan painting. This painting has an amazing uh, story. Um, I identified this painting in the Capuchin convent in Paris, was when, where I was doing some research since the Capuchin convent is the main Franciscan library in France. I was asked to have a look at this painting that the friars called Notre Dame du Japon, Our Lady of Japan. That's all they knew that maybe was made in Japan, but they didn't know anything. So I was asked to have a look at it. It was quite a huge shock. I recognized this painting. I had read the description of it in a letter uh, written by um, a French missionary in Nagasaki in 1865. Since nobody mentioned the painting, this painting later on, and since I thought that the owner of the painting could have lived in Urakami, the northern section, the Christian section of Nagasaki, I thought that the painting had been destroyed in the atomic bomb, since Urakami is the hippocenter of the atomic bomb over Nagasaki in 1945. And here it was in, um, in Paris. So in fact, um, the owner lived in Shitsu. I wrote the name here of the, the village. Shitsu is a village north of Nagasaki on the, on the sea. He, uh, since persecutions were starting in Japan in 1867, he gave this, this painting, which he had received from, from his ancestors, he gave it to a, a French missionary who sent it to France, uh, to one of his uncles, who was a parish priest in Western France. Nobody understood it, nobody kept it, nobody understood it, but everybody kept it in France. It ended up in the Capuchin convent in Paris where I, I identified it. Um, it is linked to the activities of the Franciscan. Obviously, there is St. Francis here, St. Anthony of Padua, Franciscan. by uh, the Franciscan court. It was probably intended um, for um, uh, the brotherhoods of the court, or one of the brotherhoods of the court that the Franciscans introduced in Japan. And we know from Franciscan documents that the Franciscans uh, um, asked their members to, uh, the members of their brotherhood, to defend the Immaculate Conception. Uh, I would like to just finish with this uh, by saying that the French Capuchins gave it back to Nagasaki where it was uh, born. Now, I will, I, we will turn to uh, our third point, the paintings linked with the Keicho mission. The Keicho mission is the name of the diplomatic mission that left Sendai in northeastern Japan in 1613. It is um, a kind of joint venture, so to speak, between Date Masamune, the lord of Sendai, this city northeast of Japan, and the Spaniards who were living in Japan at the time, uh, mainly Sebastian Bizcaino, the famous navigator, and a Franciscan friar who is uh, important for our topic today. His name is Sweet Louis Sotelo. He had been looking for a way to be sent to Europe in order to convince the authorities of the necessity of a new Franciscan province for Japan. Of course, he would have been the head of this new Franciscan deal with uh, Date Masamune, the Lord of Sendai, um, who was eager to 
developed the trade, the trade of his fief, the, and he paid, and I want to stress that, the, the, econ the financial aspect of this affair was uh, taken care of by Date Masamune, but uh, the technical aspect of it was taken care of by the Spaniards. Here is a picture that I took near Sendai. It's the replica of the ship that uh, the Spaniards built. Um, all the documents concerning the Keicho mission and in particular of the building of the ship have been kept in Sendai, which allowed the Japanese in our time to build a replica of the ship. But it is, I want to stress one point, the technology is um, Spanish. The, the Japanese at the time did not have uh, the skills to build such a ship. So the mission left Sendai in 1613, and for the rest of my talk, the dates are important. The ship left Sendai in 1613. The mission is headed by Hasekura Tsunenaga, who was one of the retainers, important retainers of Datis Masamune. Following the route of the Manila Galleon, the mission went to New Spain and then to Madrid and uh, to uh, Rome after a very quick stop in France because of bad weather. The mission was in Rome in 1615 and then they, the whole mission came back to Madrid and Manila. Uh, the mission reached Manila in 1618. Now, Hasekura Tsunenaga, uh, the Japanese ambassador, um, had uh, to spend two more years in Manila because the situation had changed in permission to go back to Japan. It had to wait for the answer. Uh, the process took two years. So he spent two years in Manila. When he went back, to Sendai, he introduced, he brought back paintings that are now important pieces of the Sendai City Museum. One of these paintings is a, a portrait of the Pope, Paul V, who received mission in 1615. It's mass production um, to be given to, as gifts to visitors. Very interesting. This is the portrait of Hasekura Tsunenaga, the Japanese ambassador. He's portrayed as a Christian because he was a Christian. He received baptism in Madrid while he stayed in Madrid. So he's portrayed in prayer in front of the cross. He's portrayed also as a noble European since he wears European clothes with lace, but he's also portrayed as a Japanese warrior, we can see his katana, and we can guess uh, his mage, he has kept his mage, the knotted hair of Japanese men. Uh, these two paintings were sent to Date Masamune as gifts from uh, the Roman authorities. The third painting is different. This painting, which represents a uh, saint, especially St. Francis of Assisi, with the Virgin Mary and angels playing music in the sky in the heaven, uh, this painting was given to Hasekura for his personal use. He brought it back to his home, to his family. The crease in the middle indicates that it had been folded to be hidden during the persecutions. But in fact, eventually it was confiscated by the authorities of Sendai. Until recently, we didn't know the origin of this painting in a book published in uh, Sendai in 2010, uh, which was a thorough study of the Keicho mission. Japanese historians came up with new information. The
Uh, Bianca, I think oh. uh, Sylvie is. Uh, she got cut off. She got cut off. Oh, oh uh, did you, uh, 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 can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Sylvie. Um, uh, you got cut off. Oh, oh okay. So, <laughs> um, I was saying that until recently, we didn't know the origin of this painting. Japanese historians have showed that the, it was made in Manila, probably by a Chinese artist. But I suggested another possibility. I suggested that this painting could have been made by a Japanese artist who was living in Manila at the time and who most certainly got in touch with Hasekura, the Japanese ambassador. His name is Luis Shiozuka. He was trained in the Jesuit School of Art in Nagasaki. He appears in Jesuit documents as a musician and an artist. So probably a talented man, but however, he was expelled from the uh, Society of Jesus in 1615. So he left Nagasaki and went to Manila where he lived among the uh, Japanese Christian population um, until 1618 when he met Sotelo. Sotelo, who um, ha needed Japanese priests for his missionary plans in, in Japan. So Sotelo recruited four Japanese men who became Franciscans, <clears throat> sorry, and who received ordination in the spring of 1619 after a very quick novitiate then. One of these four men is Luis Shiozuka. Um, so at this time, Hasekura was still in Japan. And both Hasekura and Shiozuka were close to, Sot to Sotelo. So most certainly the two Japanese men must have met in Manila. So, so the question is, is Shiozuka the author of this painting. This require, requires further investigation. But I still have a second question for scholars in Manila. For some obscure reasons, uh, Shiozuka didn't go over to Japan with Sotelo. He remained in Manila. He spent 15 more years of his life in Manila as a Franciscan. He was an artist. So the question is, are there any other painting, probably um, with Franciscan subjects, are there any other paintings in Manila or in the Philippines that could be related to uh, the Sendai painting? Um, this requires further investigations and this is the message that I've got for um, scholars in Manila. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that presentation, Professor Sylvie. Let us now move on to our next speaker. Uh, time check, it is now 4.58 p.m. So we are halfway through our session. So our next speaker is Dr. Patricia May Bihuridia. Patricia May Bihuridia is a professor at the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Philippines in Delman, where she teaches literature and book history. She earned her PhD on the history of the book in the Philippines from the University of London's School of Oriental and African Studies. The first formally trained book historian in the Philippines, she has authored several books and articles on Philippine bibliography, printing, and publishing. This afternoon, she will be presenting her work entitled, Where in the World Are Our Books and How Did They Get There? The survival of early Philippine imprints. Let us welcome Dr. Hurilia. What do I do? Ah, oh, there. Hello. Magandang hapon po. Uh, bom dia. Buenos dias a todos. Uh, let me share my screen. Mm. 
there. That, that's all right. Looks good. Okay, Nikki, thanks. Okay. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you today to talk about the early imprints of the Philippines. Um, whenever I do research in libraries overseas, I would always ask to see the oldest Philippine books in their collection, even when I'm not working on them. And I would always marvel at how they got there. My presentation springs from this bewilderment and fascination. Um, it is based on a work that is very much in progress, but I think the data I have now, while incomplete still, is stable and sound enough, and it can tell us something already. So let me begin the telling. Books in the Philippines have an almost ephemeral quality to them due to the conditions they are subjected to, the humid tropical climate, typhoons, floods, fires, earthquakes, termites, wars, and generally the inferior materials used in their manufacture. That the book has to contend with these multiple forces in order to survive is often raised in studies on Philippine book history. But how the book survives and why it does so in spite of such has hardly been given attention. Now is an opportune time to study the survival of books because the history of the book is at a turning point. The rapid technological developments in the book industry, digital publishing, and as in scholarship, digital humanities, are changing the way books are perceived and used and affecting the value afforded to original physical books. In the case of rare old books, these issues are perhaps all the more pronounced. It seems imperative thus to take stock of such volumes at present to better serve their future survival, whether in physical or electronic form, and to foster further scholarship on the books themselves. For Philippine book history, it seems but natural to begin this task with the rarest and oldest books are in Kinabula, which the bibliographer Wenceslao Rotana defined as books printed from 1593 to 1640 uh, from the Doctrina Cristiana en Lengua Española y Tagala in the Sherlu to the Historia de la Provincia del Santo Rosario. The ground for exploring the survival of Philippine and Kinugula is not fallow. There are studies on the early imprints by Van der Loon, Wolf, Gallo Aragon and Dominguez, and Villaroel, which serve well as preliminary matter. There are also the bibliographies and printing histories of Medina, Retana, Pado de Tavera, and Perez and Guemes. A more recent work, Regalado Trota Jose's Impreso, Philippine Imprints, 1593 to 1811, is especially important. It comprises a comprehensive list of the early books with each entry displaying thorough bibliographical information, including the location of its extant or known copies. Although in need of updating, Impreso remains an indispensable and indeed impressive resource for the study of the survival of early Philippine imprints. According to Jose's listing, and as far as I could ascertain, 101 books were published in the Philippines from 1593 to 1640, 93 of which were printed in Manila, four in Pampanga, three in Bataan, one being probable, and one in Laguna. The books were written in Spanish, Tagalog, Visayan, Hiligaynon, Iloco, Kapapangan, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, and Latin. They were on Christian catechism, doctrine, rituals, and prayers, grammars and vocabularies of various languages, rules and regulations of the religious orders, lives of the saints, accounts of contemporary Catholic martyrs, homilies, letters, and historical writings. Of these 101 titles, 53 have extant copies, while 48 have none. The extant books are now located in various libraries around Asia, Europe, and North America, with seven held in the Philippines only, 15 in the Philippines and elsewhere, and 31 elsewhere. So how did the surviving copies of these titles get to where they are now, and why? To answer these questions, I shall look at the case of one book that is both typical and unique in its survival, that of the Vocabulary de Japon, which was printed by Tomas Pinpin and Jacinto Magarulao for the Dominican Press in Manila in 1630. The book is an abridged version 
a, an abridged translation of the Portuguese vocabulario de lingua de Yapam and its supplement, which were produced by Jesuit missionaries and printed in Nagasaki, the former in 1603 and the latter in 1604. The vocabulary de Yapon is the first Japanese Spanish dictionary ever produced. The Dominican missionary Jacinto Esquivel is credited with the translation of the work, although he is not identified in the book itself. Esquivel lived during a time that was perhaps like no other for Spanish missionaries. Amidst the Spanish crown's expansion of the colonial empire and the Catholic Church's heightened endeavor in proselytization as part of the Counter Reformation movement. Both of these efforts were pursued with great zeal in Asia. For the Catholic missionaries, the ultimate destinations for conversion were Japan and China, due in no small measure to the possibility of being martyred, as the rulers of those kingdoms had become inhospitable to Christianity and eventually intolerant of it. Many accounts of the persecution of missionaries in Japan and China were produced during the 17th century, several of them printed in Manila, and these circulated in Europe and its colonies. In spite of the gruesome details they related, or precisely because of such, the story served to quicken rather than quell the desire of other missionaries to be sent to these kingdoms, as this offered opportunities for martyrdom. With a colonial government in place and a large portion of the local population Christianized, the Philippines served as an ideal base for missionary activity in China and Japan. The missionaries who came from Spain and Mexico did not directly go to these destinations, but first went to the Philippines to acclimatize themselves and to gather experience, as in the case of Esquivel, who stayed in Manila for four years before setting out for Japan. In light of the missionary zeal in Asia during the early 17th century, it is plain to see how vital were the works on the local languages, from dictionaries and grammars to translations of Christian doctrines, doctrines and rituals, sorry. Esquivel's vocabulary de Apon was one among such created to aid in the mission of conversion. It was also made as others were in accordance with the law issued by the Spanish monarch Philip III in 1619 that ordered all missionaries to, quote, know the language of the Indians, unquote. Prior to this, however, the missionaries in the Philippines had already been producing works in the local languages that were printed for their fellow priests and not the native converts. Among such books were the Doctrina Cristiana and Lengua Española y Tagala, one of the two earliest books of the Philippines, the Arte y Reglas de la Lengua Tagala, Arte de Lengua Pampanga, and Arte de Lengua Bisaya Hiligayna. The missionaries did not limit their linguistic undertakings to the local vernaculars. The other earliest book of the Philippines was in Chinese, written by Juan Cobo. The Shirlu, as it is referred to today, dealt with theology and Western concepts of cosmography and natural history. Other books in Chinese followed, such as the Doctrina Cristiana and Letra y Lengua China, Memorial de la Vida Cristiana and Lengua China, and Simbolo de la Fe and Lengua y Letra China. While these books were meant for missionaries in the Philippines, where there were large communities of Chinese immigrants, it is highly likely that they were meant just as much for the missionaries who were headed for or already in China. As for books in Japanese, Esquivel's Vocabulary de Japon was the first to be printed in the Philippines. No records are available on the distribution of this book, Thus, its reception can only be speculated upon as in the case of the aforementioned Chinese books. It is certain, however, that its publisher, Colegio de Santo Tomas, did not issue any ed edition beyond the first. After its initial circulation, Esquivel's book lay dormant for centuries. In the 19th century, it emerged in the antiquarian market as a collectible for its age, rarity, and exoticism and it was revisited, reused, and reproduced as a scholarly text for its prototypical nature. In 1835, a copy was put up for sale in Ghent as part of the library of the English book collector Richard Heber. In 1869, the Dictionnaire Japonais Francais was published by Léon Pages in Paris. This was, according to the Jesuit bibliographer Johannes Laures, based on the Bibliothèque Nationale de France's incomplete copy of the Portuguese dictionary 
supplemented by its complete copy of the Spanish version. In 1887, the Earl of Sunderland's copy of the Vocabulary de Japón was offered for sale at 30 pounds by the London bookseller Bernard Porridge. Its list price converts to around 2,400 pounds today, or around 166,000 pesos. It is not known who acquired the copy. The trail of the vocabulary de Japón goes cold again for decades until some traces emerge during World War II. According to Laures, the copy of Charles Boxer was stolen from his collection in London, and the copy of the Franciscan convent in Manila perished during the war. Then in 1972, the book saw a resurrection when a reproduction was published by the Tenri Central Library in Tokyo under their Classica Japonica facsimile series. In 1993, Jose in Impreso identified nine known copies of the Vocabulary de Japon. Since then, more copies have surfaced with more institutional libraries owning them. The digitization of the catalogs of these libraries have made it possible to create a more accurate sketch of the survival of the book into the 21st century, nearly 400 years after it was first printed. I have been able to track down 15 verified and five unverified extant copies. Of the 15 verified copies in my list, only five appeared in Jose's account. However, this does not mean that the rest of the copies were all acquired during the 1993 to 2021 period, for there were copies that understandably Jose missed in his listing. As far as it can be determined now, these are the copies of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, which was already in their collection in the 1860s, the Kirishitan Bunko Library of the Sofia Un University in Tokyo, which was in their ownership in the 1940s, the Lilly Library of Indiana University, which was acquired in the 1960s, and as noted by Laures in 1940, the Bodleian Library, one copy from University of Oxford, and the Real Biblioteca. It may be assumed that the copies of the rest of the institutions were acquired indeed within the last 28 years. This is true, for instance, of the Biblioteca Historica Marques de la Valdecilia copy, which was donated by the physician bibliophile Francisco Guerra in 2006. The copies of the vocabulary de Japon are now held in national and university libraries in seven nations in three continents, attests to the cultural and historical value that it has gained through the years, a worth that has been recognized outside of the countries that it was originally relevant to, the Philippines, Japan, and Spain. A recent development serves as further testimony of the book's value. In 2016, the PBA galleries in California put up for auction a copy that is described as exceedingly rare and purchased in Manila in 1932 from the librarian of the Philippine National Library, initialed CRB. This was Boxer's copy that was stolen during the war. The title page bears his Chinese seal. PBA galleries did not provide information on the owner of the copy. Maybe it was the one who stole it from Boxer, I don't know, um, nor the buyer at the auction. The market value of the book was estimated at 4,000 to 6,000 US dollars. It sold for $15,600 or around 780,000 pesos today. The vocabulary de Japon is typical among Philippine and Kinabula for the route it took to its survival, going through the three stages defined by Adamson Barker. First is the creation and initial reception of the book when it is used to perform the function for which it was brought into existence. Second, its resting period when it comes to rest without any use or at least intensive use. And third, its entrance into the world of collecting and scholarly research, when it is discovered that it is desirable as an object either in its own right or because of the text it contains. What makes the vocabulary de Japon unique as a Philippine incunabulum is that it is the title with the largest number of extant copies. It is impossible to say with any certainty what made the vocabulary de Japon the best survivor among Philippine Incunibula and what made those other 48 titles with no excellent copies the worst. There are many forces and variables that come into play in the survival of each book, not discounting luck. And there are not many records or accounts available on them. But what is doubtless about extant early Philippine imprints in general 
is that attendant to their entry into the third stage of survival is their transformation from material objects to cultural artifacts when they gain a cultural, historical, and monetary worth beyond their original function and materiality. In the case of the vocabulary they upon, for instance, it has become less a dictionary than a very expensive old rare book, an example of the 17th, of 17th century printing in Asia, one out of the 15 known books produced by the so-called Prince of Filipino Printers, Thomas Pintin, an object of Orientalist interest, or a prestige item for rare book collectors. I think then that what is ultimately marvelous about where our old books are and how they got there is this transformation from material object to cultural artifact, a complex process that involves transfers and adaptations of technology, political ideology, religious belief, language, and culture, or you might say a process that is essentially about encounters and interactions, about contacts and continuities. Thank you. The end. Thank you very much, Dr. Horilia, for that presentation. We now go to our final speaker, Dr. Cuauhtémoc Villamar, who is a retired Mexican diplomat with a PhD in history from the National University of Singapore and an MSc in public policy. He is also an economist at UNAM. He is here today to present his work entitled The Manila Galleon and the Globalization of Baroque. Let us welcome Dr. Villamar. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, I want to share my screen. It's is visible. Yes, we can see your screen. We can see your screen, Dr. Viaman. Ah, very well. Um, well, um, but it's the Zoom link. Please open your presentation. Yeah, second, second. Uh, apparently. Now? Yes, we can see it. Can you please um, play it? Yeah, okay. okay thank you. First of all, I must acknowledge my gratitude to the organizers of this event because I came in contact with several authors that I have been following for years. Mostly, I got a better idea of what the Filipino intellectuals think about the cultural heritage, both local and foreign legacies, showing a great deal of of variety in this large archipelago. Uh, I'm thinking uh, Fernando Cialcita, Vicente Rafael, René Javellana, and the late Nick Joaquin. This is a learning process. This, uh, what I'm going to present today is an ongoing work. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Juan Luis Suarez, uh, the director of the Culture Flex Laboratory at the University of Western Ontario in Canada that oriented me in discovering the network analysis and the Baroque. The following notes are part of an ongoing research with, this with the team of the CulturePlex. Therefore, all your comments will be of interest for further development of the current study. The presentation explores the, the cross-cultural nature of the Manila Galleon system and its distribution to the early modern globalization which broadly corresponds to the beginning of the splendor of the Baroque era. At the study of trade, the study of trade and culture may appear unconnected, but a closer look at the pivotal role of the Manila Galleon system in the globalization of trade also shows the crucial role of this trading system in the construction of the Baroque as a cultural model in the space dominated by the, by the Habsburg during the 16th and 17th century. This is a proposal that used two groups of concepts. The studies of the Manila Galleon as trading system and the analysis of the Baroque as a historical formation. 
both corpora of analysis have gone their separate ways. This uh, study is an initial attempt in my site to formulate questions and to deploy a strategy to better understand the interrelations in, between both research domains. This is a proposal to read more systematically the mass of information accumulated by material evidence of the Trans-Pacific trade and to understand the links between the people, the species, uh, the natural species and the objects they exchange during the, through the system of the Manila Gallery. Based on outstanding examples of material culture in the Pacific route, this study focuses on goods as vehicles of culture. This has been an important turn in the historical interpretation, detaching from the image of dead objects routinely enlisted in commercial statistics. The development of global history highlight, highlights the historical and cultural context of the societies that produce, trade, and consume merchandise, things in terms of Arjuna Apadurai. Trade played a social role in the cultural environments of distant societies, connecting producers, intermediators, and final consumers. The pivotal role of the trans-Pacific trade in the process of globalization since the foundation of, uh, foundation of Manila in 1571 has been emphasized in several uh, studies, drawing attention to the circulation of American silver in exchange of a wide range of Asian merchandise. The focus in this case is the relation between Asia and the Americas on the 16th and 17th century, usually considered wrongly as peripheral areas at the initial moment of the so-called early globalization. This concept has been changing recently in the last two decades uh, understanding that there is a, a polycentric uh, environment in which different areas, different points play uh, an important role, even they were not the capitals, formal capitals of the empire. I'll, I must point, point out that in the present text, the reference to culture is treated in the broader sense, is treated in the broader sense. It is not limited to art, philosophy, or science but to social actions, customs, rituals, beliefs, and techniques, arts, which give life to the human community. In addressing the issue of interaction generated across the Pacific, I have consciously sought to separate myself from the Eurocentric or binary East-West approach. Uh, briefly, I, I want to mention the idea of material culture, even if this uh, has been mentioned, during this session clearly and directly by the colleagues. But the, the idea is that material culture, I want to insist, refers to the human creation of objects that reflect a particular way of life with a specific use of interpretation of those objects. That appreciation may change over time as some items change hands and were valued differently by the commercial intermediaries the final and the final owners or consumers. Therefore, objects can show past relations, relationships between human beings and perform as interfaces of cultural networks. I want to emphasize this concept. Cultural networks are uh, the, the linkages that are not so not easy uh, to see, not evident per se, but the, that transport, decide which uh, products will be uh, transferred to other places, and uh, the networks that evaluate in their own cultural terms, the value of certain products that can be appreciated in terms of, of beauty or in terms of uh, economy by other consumers, maybe in the other side of the world. This is similar to the concept of trading networks that I study in a book uh, recently published in which I describe the connection of Portuguese merchants that participate in the Malina Galleon and they um, sold products uh, produced all over in Asia into New Spain and Europe. Uh, now, on referring to the Baroque, 
the, in the I, uh, I use, I prefer to use the definition by Werner Weisbach, which plays Baroque art as instrument of the Roman Christian church and its strategy to, to counter Protestant culture in Europe. Historians have widely documented the solid link that existed between the counter reform of the early 16th century and the developments of Baroque culture of the consequence, subsequent two centuries. The principles and uh, resolutions of the Council of Trent, 1545-1563, were openly intended to stand against the Reformation. For the analysis of the Baroque pointed out that it was a historical formation un under the political configuration of absolutism in Europe that deployed its power across the Atlantic. This cultural formation reached some parts of Asia mostly via the American viceroyalties of New Spain and Peru over a long period of intense human contacts and exchanges. This interpretation placed its emphasis on the realm of politics and society rather than on artistic styles, the way in which normally Baroque is understood. A more complete interpretation of this historical period needs to incorporate uh, several characteristics proposed by um, uh, Jose Antonio Maraval. The Baroque is a social formation directed from the top in societies that were already massive, urban, urbanized, and conservative. These features are essential, but not exclusive to, the, to define the Baroque as a cultural model that shaped shape several societies under the Spanish monarchy around the, the world. The emphasis even more, from 1571 to 1640, the kings of Spain also held the crown of Portugal, expanding even more that area of influence of the Baroque. The Baroque had uh, its origin in the Mediterranean space with the Roman accent, but we uh, can focus more and more to the idea that the Baroque uh, expanded also through the, the diffusion in Mexico and Lima, as has been said uh, before, and also the Philippines, Goa, Malacca, and Macao. Uh, the Spanish monarchy under the Habsburg rule opened the planetary circulation to a large space in which human beings, societies, and civilizations move. The, the way of this diffusion is um, complex, definitely. It lay uh, the, the idea of moving through ideological persuasion, that is the possibility to in, uh, educate, to inculcate the ideas of Christianity uh, in the concept of the Roman Catholic religion, but also through the, uh, the power of the church through elements like the Inquisition to fight against deviations from the canon, that is the heresy, heresy, the abandonment of the Christian faith, the apostasy, and the rejection of the papal authority, the schisma. Equally important, but of different scope, was the missionary expansion of the Catholic Church that, uh, that um, implies the, the full role of the, of the church, that is the proselytism. Uh, an element that can be added to this complex element is the parallelism that exists be between the biological process of this expansion of the world, the connection of all uh, areas of the, of the planet that exactly happened at the same time. The broad biological process took place through the 16th century with the movement of the species, animals, and plants that silently changed the configuration of human culture worldwide. This process cannot be studied separately from the trade and migration around the globe. The concept of Columbus change, uh, exchange, uh, uh, work by uh, Crosby, Alfred Crosby, when the biological exchange began, began at the Atlantic in the specific year of 1592, was to continue through the subsequent centuries with the great intensity by way of the Pacific Ocean. 
We must consider that the centers of greatest genetic variation are unevenly distributed through the world. In the early days of globalization, the consequences of this exchange in various directions were dec decisive for many societies, enriching their diets and the use of natural species from animal fodder to textiles for clothing. Almost no place in the planet was left untouched by this formidable genetic exchange in which the Manila Galleon played an important role connecting the Americas and Asia. A parallel process occurred in the cultural and social level. Forces of convergence happen on different places, similar to the adaptation of a species in, in lands that naturally were different. However, the cultural aspects follow a different way and rhythm because the mutation depends mainly of the adaptation and inventive of the peoples. The culture is not linked to the transference of bits of culture from parents of two offsprings. Therefore, the transference can happen in very short time. Um, if I have time, I want to put an example of how tr this, the treatment of these networks happen. The case of the chocolate, the porcelain, and the trade and power. This is an example of um, a silver plate made in, in New Spain in which the, the center part is fixed and is to contain a, a cup to drink chocolate. That was um, the example to uh, avoid spilling the chocolate, uh, was used and asked into Japan and other places, China, to produce the same type of cup to, to be used in New Spain and Peru. These are uh, uh, the, the type of um, mixed culture, the inbreeding between two different cultures that were used for the, for, uh, during the, the Baroque time. Um, if we consider the, the Baroque as a historical formation, and I firmly think so, uh, this, the transmission of information between different parts of the planet allowed not only the Roman Catholic uh, religion, but the, uh, a lot of different expressions of culture uh, locally produced uh, through various uh, ways, codes from objects, material culture, or through the performance of ceremonies, masses, festivals, and artistic expressions of literature, paint, and music. This process of codification and decodification was a characteristic of the early modern globalization that irradiates mainly from the Iberian Empire, Spain and Portugal, and blended with multiple expressions to other societies in Europe and the Americas and beyond. The assertive Roman Catholic, Catholic Church was always vigilant against uh, the possible influence of the English and Dutch Protestants in Asia and so potential enemies of as the Islam sprawl in Southeast Asia. The, the post preventing practices had a deep impact in the religious ceremonies, the architecture, the music, the scientific knowledge, with an explicit intention of encompassing the entire Iberian spa imperial space as the, and the action of the religious orders that were central forces of the Iber Iberian empires for the ideological and cultural approach to Asia. The separation between Portuguese and Spanish missionary structures do not, does not detract from the fact that all the religious orders follow the Baroque model in their action. Roman Christians missionaries in Asia had always in mind the experience of religious conversion in Mexico and Peru with mixed results for the enforcement of the Rom Roman Catholic religion among large population nations under the Spanish rule. The intentions to er eradicate the indigenous religions had several lasting effects, such as the unexpected syncretism of the religion practices and the magnificent art on stone on churches and cathedrals with indigenous additions that are displayed through the Americas and parts of Asia. To, to uh, go to um, more specific elements, we can talk about 
the themes that were dominant during the Baroque. It was a time of, um, uh, in literature and art in Spain, for example, considered of golden age, Velázquez, uh, Lope de Vega, and many other great author, authors, painters, etc. but economic stagna stagnation in Europe. That was a kind of paradox. It was a time of war and absolutism, centralization of power. It was the time of the uh, um, expansion of the mining of silver in New Spain and Peru, the centers of the main producer of silver in the world at that time. This was the major force that uh, made the contact with the Asian economies uh, have been uh, uh, widely still studied, um, studied the um, relation with China, but also uh, there are many other elements in the relation with Southeast Asia, for example. There is, and there, it was a um, talk about this in the previous seminar, uh, um, that about the proliferation of arbitrism uh, that suggested the reform of economic policies in a way and advance uh, related to the economic um, ideology that was replaced centuries later by the modern economy. The, uh, the literature uh, attract the idea of fear of death, like Historia Tragico Maritima, that is essential, essentially the problem of wreckages in the, in the sea. It was uh, the appearance of new objects and subjects contributed to the Spanish and Portuguese languages. And as I, I have mentioned, the biological exchange induced cultural exchange. Uh, there is also, uh, as has been mentioned, the elements of accommodation uh, uh, by the Jesuits uh, to connect with China and Japan, and the elements of science in the form of the 16th and 17th century in astronomy, mapping, painting, music, all together as uh, mechanisms to attract the otherness, to attract the, the uh, societies that were considered uh, respectfully, uh, uh, societies quietly advanced like Ch China and Japan. The Jesuits developed also the gift diplomacy that is most of the, the objects that we, we can still see in many uh, museums are product of exchange presents to the elites in Asia. Uh, I will not talk about that. So what is uh, possible to analyze, to observe in the, in the present time and is part of the every, every day in, in, the, in Peru or in, or in New Spain is the presence of the Asian uh, examples that are hidden in different parts of the, our society, our, our Mexican, for example, or Peruvian societies, the images of the uh, uh, relation with Asia. This is the case of Francis Javier, that uh, the, is the iconic element of the connection with Asia and was the, the mo one of the most important images existing in the, uh, among the Christians in America, in the Americas. This is another case, another example of an enconchado. This is the lacquer with shell in which Francis Javier is planning apparently his trip to Asia and concretely to China. This is a Mexican example. Then uh, we have um, the case of three paintings that are in the church of La, La Profesa. And I thank the, the, the archive of La Profesa for these paintings in which um, they depict uh, Francis Javier with the Asian uh, examples. Obviously the indigenous people there don't look like Asian, but it's the imagination of the people of New Spain. This is also Francisco Javier talking to uh, people of Asia, according to the painter. And the death of Francisco Javier in, uh, uh, um, outside China, 
also with image, uh, in a lot of imagination about what it means, the Asian population. Uh, last in the list of uh, Asian themes is the importance of urban development. That is, hand in hand, the, uh, the response to the increase of population in the uh, Iberian empires and the combination of architecture and political ideals that gave sense to order or, uh, to the ex imperial expansion. And one more example that I, I want to finish with is the uh, Saint San Felipe de Jesus, that was one of the martyrs, martyrs in Franciscans in 1597 in Nagasaki. And he became the first Mexican saint. He was um, born in Mexico and it, the image of Francis, uh, San Felipe de Jesus represents the uh, power empowering of the Creole people, Mexicans at that time, 1597, practically half century after the conquest of Mexico. And he became the center part of the religion in Mexico. In this case, this is an image or the Im first image, main image in his chapel at the National Cathedral of Mexico City. And there is one more that can be attractive. That is in the Cathedral of Cuernavaca, that is 100 kilometers from Mexico. This is the a mural uh, of early 17th century about the martyrs in Japan. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Tames for these uh, photo photos in which there is a depiction of the uh, martyrs, 1597, uh, according to the, to the uh, artists, probably indigenous people, artists in this Franciscan uh, church, the cathedral, in which they show the, the traveling to uh, Nagasaki, where they were, uh, they endure martyrdom. San, Francis, uh, San, San Felipe still is not uh, the outstanding, but he became one of them, that is, he was Mexican, the first Mexican saint. And this already has uh, 450 years, this, uh, these frescoes uh, as part of the, um, let's say, education, religious education in, the, uh, in Mexico. Uh, to wrap up, the idea is there is not a center, exclusive center of the expansion of the Baroque, and the, uh, the, the bits of information brought from one side to another and back, uh, um, and back uh, include so many cultural elements that create that possibility of a connection that is still we have uh, and we modified over time and we create uh, new forms of expression. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Guao. It's now time for us to, po to pose questions to our speakers. I would now like to invite the conference participants in this Zoom room to please type in your questions in the chat box. You may also raise your hand so I can call you in case you want to ask your questions directly to our speakers. Um, but before we begin with our questions, I'd like to acknowledge our team of community managers the Ateneo organizers led right now by Chas Navarro, monitoring on YouTube, while Alex Garadilla from the National Historical Commission is monitoring the questions from the Facebook live stream on the National Quincentennial Committee site. Okay, so to everyone who would like to ask their questions, you may now type in your questions. We have here some earlier questions that were posed to our speakers. Uh, the first one is addressed to all of our um, presenters. All your talks have a lot of movement. What would each speaker say was the motive behind such movements? Was it Christian zeal? So this question came from Dean Jonathan Chua. So 
to whoever wants to answer the question first, you may unmute your microphone. So to repeat the question, all your talks have a lot of movement. What would each speaker say was the motive behind such movements? Was it Christian zeal? Um, how do I do this? Um, as I speak. Hmm. I, okay, sorry, can I can I try to answer? Yes, you may. Okay. Uh, so um yes, I, I, I believe that in fact all of us stressed uh, how dynamic um, this period uh, was. We're, we were talking about the 16th, 17th, even the 18th centuries uh, in a world that was um, in fact uh, um, a, a very dynamic world. And even more so during this time uh, in which uh, uh, different parts of the world, different cultures, uh, sometimes for the first time we're put into contact. Uh, and also, um, I believe that we uh, must look uh, in, in to the agents of this circulation. So we are talking mainly about, uh, we talked about, about merchants whose life was uh, by, by essence, uh, uh, a life of the circulation, also missionaries. Although missionaries um, tended to be sometimes the fixed presence in a certain territory, um, but they also were object of uh, uh, different movements. Um, and even so, uh, uh, more so also, even for the, the agents of the um, admi administration. So uh, uh, it, it was essential for these uh, um, dynamics to function, that uh, everything circulated in a, a level, I would say probably in an unprecedented level. Um, and uh, the movement of people, of ideas, of objects, of commodities, all our talks, uh, uh, in fact, highlighted, uh, I highlighted this. Okay, thank you. I think Dr. Guo has something to say. Um, I think the, the mobility of particularly people um, uh, has been a characteristic of the, of the humankind forever. This is demonstrated uh, first in, in Eurasia, in which there, is, uh, there were contacts uh, between the Mongols and Europeans, and the Europeans going to the Middle East or vice versa. This is a part of the humankind. What happened in the 16th century was the possibility to interact with new spaces, with new, uh, much larger space, uh, such a large uh, um, area that it was very difficult to understand. And one of the problems was precisely the curiosity to, to know what was America and to create the, uh, the understanding of America as a whole, as a, as a definition, because it was not in the Bible, not was uh, in the canonical um, uh, understandings. So it was some kind of uh, invention of America. And that was part of the, uh, the goal of missionaries and other uh, explorers. Asia was better known for the Europeans before, at least in certain, um, um, in certain way, diffuse and, and far away, but at least it was the knowledge. So the opening of the connection through the Pacific uh, created the possibility to, to make um, a fact, the connections between America and the new Spain, uh, uh, America and, and Asia. And 
the, the trigger in this case was economic. We can say that it was the exchange of silver uh, uh, for uh, silk and many other products. But essentially it's this capacity of the humans of uh, uh, moving, migrating in order to find better opportunities in, in their lives. Okay, Professor May. Yes, um, for books, initially um, it was, it had much to do with Christian zeal uh, because they were produced um, to aid in the mission of conversion, generally books of the, the Philippine Indian Ruler. But um, much later on, it had nothing to do, I think, with Christianity at all. It was collectible seal uh, and just interest in um, building libraries. And you know, they, they, as I mentioned, you know, they were art, they became artifacts and they were collectibles. Uh, and also um, maybe you know, to, to tie uh, it would an economic um, uh, factor also because they become very expensive items. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the responses to that question. I believe uh, we have a question coming in from Father Tony De Castro. You may unmute your mic if you want to, uh, should you want to ask your question now? Uh, yes, I'd like to thank all the speakers. They were all very, very informative and I think they help us to kind of widen our own horizons, particularly here in the Philippines when let's say in talking about history, we're so much more uh, still, I think, kind of trapped in a nationalist discourse. No? I think all of these talks uh, uh, this afternoon kind of bring us out of our own shell uh, to see the Philippines precisely connected uh, to all of these places, to China, to Japan, to New Spain, Mexico, to Europe. Uh, uh, and to other parts of Asia. Uh, I'd like to first uh, make a comment, uh, maybe, uh, and I don't know whether uh, Professor Alexander would like to respond to it, and then a question I'd like to pose to uh, Dr. Morishita. Uh, uh, to, to Professor Alexander, I attended a conference in Macau many, many years ago, and I think Angelo Cataneo, who spoke here as well, uh, talked about that map of Matteo Ricci. And, uh, and, and perhaps here's a hermeneutical thing about how to read maps. Uh, because basically that map is a very interesting map because at the center of it is the ocean. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, usually maps are made by the power that, that is, and, and, and if it's the United States, then the United States is at the center of the map. No? If it's China, then China is the center of the map. If it's Europe, then Europe is at the center of the map. But Matteo Ricci's map is, is the Pacific Ocean. It's an ocean. There's nothing there but water. So I guess uh, uh, th that fact alone, I guess, maybe should provoke uh, questions and, and uh, why? Why did Matteo Ricci make this map this way? Now, I remember in that conference, somebody suggested to uh, Angelo, that uh, Matteo Ricci being a Jesuit, okay, uh, to consider the map as an aid to prayer. Because in the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius, uh, uh, the beginning of the second week of the spiritual exercises, Ignatius uh, writes that uh, he invites the one doing the spiritual exercises, doing the retreat, to look at the world as it were, from above. Okay. And, uh, and uh, one possible reason, therefore, uh, for Matteo Ricci doing, making that map uh, in that way or, or designing it that way is precisely significant in terms of uh, looking at the world as, as a unity, but not putting any human empire or human a power at the center of it, but rather a void, uh, which is water. Okay? But water, I guess, that connects precisely all the places around it. Okay? So I don't know whether you'd want to make a comment. It's a plea, in a sense, also not to let go or not to sideline theological, perhaps, understandings or interpretations of even material objects like 
maps or or uh, or even uh, the, the fascinating things that you wrote about uh, those panels, no? the folding panels and, and all that. I don't know whether you'd want to say anything about it, but before you do, my question to uh, uh, Dr. Sylvie, it, it's about um, uh, the, the state of, I'm really surprised that in Japan, it seems that many things did survive the material uh cultural objects and religious objects i was wondering whether you'd be able to tell us what uh is this something rare then that that we you, we, we find in japan or is this uh, uh because my impression was that basically these things uh were obliterated you know destroyed or uh taken out of japan but the fact that there are surviving icons or, or religious paintings or or things like that in in japan what's the state of that is this something uh common or is it in fact a rare thing so uh, those are my comments uh and questions thank you okay um you asked about the, the works of art that have survived. One thing that I would like to point is that nothing has survived from the buildings connected with the Japanese missions. Um, the, the, the Christianity was banned in Japan in 1614, and in the early 1620s, all, all the churches have had been destroyed. And now um, I walked around Nagasaki looking for um, the places associated with Christianity in the 16th century. Every time, uh, if, everywhere, where there, were, there used to be a, a, um, a church or the Japanese residence. And now there is either a street, a Buddhist temple, or a Shinto sanctuary, or an administrative building. So um, very, very quickly, everything was destroyed. Just, Mm, 20 years ago, something showed up. Um, the, for the, there were big um, construction building to uh, renew um, a primary school. And um, they, the Japanese found the foundations of the Dominican church. It, just the foundation, that's that room. It, it is now um, a museum. But now, for the, the works of art, uh, they, were, they were about, let's say, a, a rough number, a uh, hundred pieces, about a hundred pieces, maybe a little bit more. They were transmitted for two reasons. Some of those were transmitted because they were confiscated to Christians. That's all the documents kept in the Tokyo National Museum, for example. They were, as I said, kept in a storage room called Christian um, um, no, Shumongura in Japanese. And it was a special room in the Palace of Governor and uh, where they kept the, the objects and, and uh, works of art confiscated to Christians. Now, that is one um, particular way that they got transmitted. But it, it's, it's strange why they did not um, destroy this. It, it's not very clear. And another channel by which those works of art were transmitted is the, because they were hidden by the Japanese Christians in amazing places. Um, some works of art were found hidden in Buddhist temples, for example, which was very clever because it was the only place where the authorities would not search for Christian paintings. Um, some were uh, hidden in, in private homes, uh, discovered, for example, one is very famous, I think, it's uh, a painting of the 15 Mysteries of the Rosary, now kept in the library of Kyoto University. It was uh, found in the early 1930s when uh, the, the, the farmers um, of a village called Sendaiji, which, which is up in the mountains between um, Osaka and Kyoto, uh, the villagers decided to renew the thatch roof of a farmhouse. 
Now, farmhouses, traditional farmhouses in Japan have very thick roofs and they don't change it every year. They change it maybe every 200 years or so. So in the 1930s, they took off the, the old uh, thatch roof and they found a bamboo rod attached to the highest beam of the, the, uh, the house, uh, the roof, and they opened it. And inside, they found a painting of these um, 15 rosaries of the, mis the mysteries of the rosary. In the same village, they found a historian who was um, invest investigating about the, the sites of the Buddhist temple. Buddhist temples heard of a box in a private home, which uh, was never opened. So he convinced the farmers to open the box and we found amazing works of art. In particular, the um, Salvatore Mundi that Alessandra Crovello uh, showed, um, which is a really nice, beautiful painting. And so th that's how they transmitted another series, other paintings, I should mention, yes, the, the secular screens, since the Jesuits in their school in Nagasaki produced secular screens to be offered to powerful daimyos. And these screens were kept because they were uh, owned by daimyos. So they were kept within the residences of those daimyos, I mean, feudal lords. And since they were secular, um, secular subjects, they were not uh, confiscated. They were not considered as, as dangerous. Although I would like to mention that one Japanese historian uh, suggested that they were bilingual. Bilingual, they could be read uh, both by Europeans, Western, Westerners and Japanese, both by Christians and Buddhists. This is what she, what her, her theory. That's how those works of art were uh, transmitted. But I would like to point one thing that the, the um, I think after years of research about that, that, that the paintings that were found hidden in private homes were not made for private homes. I am convinced that they were taken there after the ban on Christianity. When the churches were closed, the missionaries brought those paintings to the private home of Christians they could trust. Thank you. It's, it's probable, it's po most probably the two paintings that I showed were altarpieces for churches. And then they were carried to the private homes of Christians after the ban of Christianity. Professor Alexandra, would you want to say something? Yes, I'll try. Thank you very much. I'll try to be very, very brief. Um, in fact, you mentioned Angelo Catania, who I know very, very well. We have been working together. And uh, if all goes well this year, we will have a, a book published stemming from a, a project, a research project, and uh, it will be called Interactions Between Rivals, the Christian Mission and Buddhist Sects in Japan, where precisely in uh, uh, some of the essays, we will discuss uh, uh, topics that were just pointed by you and also Professor Sylvie Morista. So uh, uh, about uh, the, the, the Ritchie map, we talk about Ricci map, but in fact, as Angelo uh, always stresses, this is a joint work, uh, right. teamwork with different, with diverse um, uh, protagonists. So Ricci was one of them, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but this, uh, this subject that uh, Professor Morishita just uh, uh, stressed now, this bilingual, um, uh, capacity or nature of these works that was uh, very, very well, uh, well uh, discussed by Naoko uh, Francis Hioki um, is precisely one of the features, in my view, of these uh, folding screens, cartographic folding screens. And the fact that they were uh, probably made within the uh, uh, 
environment of the Christian mission and the painting seminary also can uh, shed a light on this uh, syncretic nature of the, the image itself. So I, I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have here a few questions for Professor May. In the case of book collecting, did the collectors think of the book as an economic investment? And what made it a good to be desired? That's the first question. The second question is, book collecting is really a very interesting and yet very expensive hobby and work here in the Philippines. In your research on looking into the history of early Philippine imprints, which book or books would be considered the most expensive in terms of its rarity? Professor May. Yes, thanks. Thanks for those questions. Um, on the first one for about economic desire, it's really hard to say and to generalize what drives collectors um, and collectors you know, don't necessarily go for, val always go for valuable things. It's just things they like, uh, things that have meaning to them, their families or whatever. Although there are some who, like those who play the stock market, who will buy uh, antiquarian um, books with an eye of for reselling it as an investment and they do their research. So there are those who play the game. But in, in general, people collect um, what they like, what means, what, what, what is valuable to them. If it's ultimately money that is valuable to them, then, um, you know, their collections would serve that. Um, the second question on the most expensive book in the Philippines, um, well, the Inquinabula would be priceless, um, but I think, I think the, the ultimate uh, Philippine book uh, for any Filipina collector any, is, 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 is um, um, sorry, there's a, there's a feedback on sorry, my a, microphone. Uh, okay. Okay. It's clear. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. Um, as I was saying, you know, the ultimate, um, uh, Philippine book, uh, the Holy Grail is Nolly and Philly. Um, so these are 19th century books. Um, but uh, they're um, the, 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 yeah, the most expensive. The, the last um, Noli copy, Noli Metangere, the, the novel of Jose Rizal, the last uh, copy that was uh, for sale and uh, it belonged to his sister uh, sold for 7 million pesos, I think. Uh, it started its list price at a, a few hundred thousand, which I thought was ridiculously low, but uh, it sold to an unknown bidder uh, for 7 million pesos. So, um, I, 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 and, and again, in, in book collecting, it's not so much age or, or rarity, but there are so many things around it because old books are not necessarily valuable. People have this mistaken notion that it's old, it's rare, it's valuable. Uh, and and that, that, that's, that's not really so. If there's no demand for it, there's no interest, and there's no um, significance, be it cultural, historical, or whatever, then it, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's not worth much. Okay, thank you, for, uh, thank you for answering the question, Professor May. We have another question for Dr. Scarvello and Morishita. Was there a movement of technique and design of Japanese artistry to the Philippines, both in sacred representations and architecture and other forms of art? Are there examples of these that exist until today? Dr. Sylvie, would you want to go first? Please unmute your microphone. I have not investigated a lot about the links between um, the missions in, in Japan and in the Philippines. And um, so I cannot answer. The, 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 the um, painting that I mentioned, the Sendai painting, is really an exception. Is really an exception, I think. Uh, 
due to the presence of Hasekura in Japan with Sotelo. And it's just by chance that I managed to get to Shiozuka. And in fact, it's, I, I, I understood that when I was researching about my compatriot, Guillaume Courte, who is the only Frenchman who took part in the um, Japanese missions since um, he was a Dominican and he was allowed to go to the Philippines with the Dominicans. And I could not understand that. It was strange since the Spaniards did not allow foreigners in their missionary fields abroad. And, and it's when I um, had to give a lecture in his birthplace in Southern France that I was allowed to uh, browse through, through books that I had not found before, and that I, I understood that there was a connection between Guillaume Courte and Shio Uzuka, since Shio Uzuka, and I, I should mention that, he, he, he died in Nagasaki, in fact, because Shio Uzuka met the Dominicans who came from Spain in the mid-1630s. Um, the Dominicans wanted to go to Japan. They needed a Japanese priest with them since they couldn't speak Japanese. They met Shiozuka, who then became a Dominican. They all crossed to Japan. They got caught right away, tortured, and they were put to death in Nagasaki. And th th that's how uh, there is a connection between um, Guillaume Courte, or Guillermo Courte, as the Spaniards call him, and uh, Shiozuka. That's how I understood the connection uh, between the Dominicans and, and Shiozuka. And then, who was, uh, Shiozuka was a Franciscan. He had a strange life, really, because he was a Jesuit, a Franciscan, and a Dominican. I would like to say he's a saint for the Catholic Church. The, this group of Dominicans were canonized, and Shiozuka has got his statue in Nagasaki, uh, statues uh, which were inaugurated in 2015. 16 statues of people who were put to death in Nagasaki, all of them coming from the Philippines. That is maybe the, for the sake of contact and continuities, they, um, they, he's got it. Those Philippine martyrs, are, uh, I've got their statue in the small garden of Nakamachi Church in, uh, in, in Nagasaki. So I think that the, uh, the, the Sendai painting is an exception. Dr. Carvello, would you want to, ans to answer the question? I, I totally agree. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, I would say that uh, um, also Shozuka was the exception of someone, someone associated with the painting seminary. Uh, and I must say, although the painting seminary was directly connected with the Jesuits, we know that uh, um, the mendicants also uh, were uh, uh, associated with it. So. Uh, other religious orders were associated with the painting seminary. This is an important, I would say, an important feature. So, but after uh, 1614, when the, there was the expulsion of the missionaries from Japan, um, uh, uh, most of them went to Macau. Even Giovanni Niccolo, who ran the, the, the painting seminary, left uh, to Macau. Uh, and uh, uh, very few, uh, well, uh, this is the exception, went to, to, to Manila. So we find documental proof of the uh, Japanese, well, this, uh, uh, I would not say Japanese, but Western and Japanese techniques traveling from Japan to Macau and other parts of China uh, with uh, the works with, uh, of uh, uh, Giacomo Niva, Emmanuel Pereira, and, and others. And uh, um, eventually, you also know that probably because of this uh, 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 embassy that Professor Morishta referred to in her talk uh, of uh, Date Masamune, Hasekura Tsunegaga, they left from Japan to Spain through the Pacific, that uh, um, some of the Japanese didn't travel to Spain, remain in Mexico, and eventually stayed in Mexico. And uh, some scholars argue that uh, some Japanese who stayed in Mexico probably disseminated in the territory of New Spain um, some of the techniques which can explain also not only the travel of the objects, but remaining of these people in Mexico can explain 
the dissemination of techniques applied to uh, the construction of folding screen, biombo, and also of laca, uh, uh, that in Mexico uh, is associa uh, associated with the term or the name maque. So um, this uh, is a, an argument, but again, for the Philippines, uh, uh, I, 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 I haven't found any evidence other than the one already mentioned by uh, Sylvie Morista. But maybe that, that, that this research is still to be done, it, it yeah. needs to be done. Yeah, probably. Even in the Philippines and, the, and uh, uh, in, in, in Manila for sure. Yes, like I was very surprised by May's talk and I was very surprised to find out that in first, the, the first Kunabula was published in 1593, which is just about the same date as the, print, the Jesuit printing press in Japan. The, just to add, the, the press uh, of the Jesuits in Japan was eventually shipped to Manila uh, when they were expelled. And it was, I think the Franciscans got it. Uh, so uh, oh, really? yeah. there's your co continuities for you there. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That, that is very interesting. Okay, we have one final question for the Q&A, and this one is addressed to Dr. Kuao. In terms of Baroque art being present here in the Philippines, it would be more applicable and visible in the architecture of churches, especially in the earthquake prone areas. I am referring to earthquake baroque used to describe these churches by Father René Javeliana. I am curious if the same could be applied to some churches in Mexico and other parts of South America. Dr. Kuao. Please unmute your mic. Yes, uh, I do agree with that idea that the, uh, the Baroque, uh, earthquake Baroque, let's say, uh, in the Philippines, is an adaptation, very practical adaptation to the style of the Baroque, uh, with the um, as a response to the reality of of the of the land. So the bell towers separate from the main building. Uh, it's interesting how in Ayoac, in, in North Luzon, in, in, in Ilocos North, there is specifically one uh, church that has a lot of important counterforts, support from the outside. And this was a type of uh, architecture developed in Mexico that is also earthquake prone. And uh, it was uh, the Santa Clara uh, church that is from the similar time. So it's, it's, most, it's really possible, and I think it's possible to trace through archives, the way in which um, architects, builders uh, from New Spain uh, uh, transfer information or the way of construction to the Philippines. But anyway, the most important thing is that this um, creation, innovation of uh, culture and techniques uh, was possible precisely because the existence of these networks of culture. And this is uh, the valuable part in terms of the intense traffic movement. And second, the, the reality of a new society, a new reality that some of the thinkers about Baroque uh, know in this point as the kind of modernity that was created at that time. And this kind of modernity was um, obliged by the uh, modernity created by the Anglo-Saxon societies with the, uh, in the 18th and 19th century, um, leaving behind the idea that uh, the, um, the 16th and 17th century was backward. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Kuao. Uh, thank you to our panelists for answering all of those questions. I would now, uh, I would now like to give the floor over to Ms. Mickey for uh, an announcement. Okay, Ms. Mickey. 
Oops, I was muted. I'm so sorry. I just had to give this announcement. Ateneo University Press is going to come up with a contacts and continuities 30% discount for a limited time only for books that were written by conference speakers, including May Hurilia, who is one of our speakers today. So on Shopee and Lazada, and even for international viewers, um, you can buy ebooks. People, uh, the following people and the titles of their books that they published with Ateneo Press. Now, these were speakers from Contacts and Continuities. Um, Jonathan Chua, Rene Javeliana, Luis Francia, Vina Lanzona, Beatriz Alvarez Tardio, Fernando Chiazita, Agustin Rodriguez, Adolfo Dacanay, Vicente Rafael, Aitor Anduaga, Gary De Villas, Pedro Luengo, Patricia May Hurilia, and Sandra Castro. You may get their books at a discount because of the conference from July 21 to 25. So we will post this in our website and our social media. I'm so sorry, I just put this in because Mane Aurelia is here and it's on the topic of the book. Back to you, Bianca, for upcoming events and to wrap up our panel. Okay, thank you for that. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so just for the up, the upcoming events for the rest of uh, the conference. Tomorrow, July 16 at 7 p.m., we will have our 16th panel on literature that will be hosted by the Modern Languages Department. Then on the 19th, we will have a two-part panel, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, that, and that will be on cultural flows and reinvention. So we will have six speakers in total for that day. On the 21st at 7.30 p.m., we will have the panel on fashion. And on the 22nd at 4 p.m., we will be having the panel on language and identity formation. We hope to see you guys at those events and many others to follow. So in behalf of the Department of Fine Arts and the School of Humanities of Ateneo de Manila University and our partners, CHAM, uh, Centro de Humanidades, Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, and the National Quincentennial Commission, I thank you all for joining us today. Have a good day and goodbye. Thank you. Yay. Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> hey.